Well, um, a few weeks ago, uh, as many of you will know that we finished a sermon series on the first half of the book of Acts. And as we have looked through the book of Acts, we have seen the gospel work inside people's hearts, and we've seen the gospel work outside in the world, transforming us on the inside and also transforming the world through us by the power of God, the movement of the Holy Spirit. And so we call that series the Inside Out Gospel. Well, today we are starting a new sermon series, and uh, we're going to be looking at the second half of the book of Acts. And what is different about the second half of the book of Acts is that, um, not that this is completely new, but this is definitely when the powers and the forces of the world start pushing back against the, uh, the new Christians. We certainly see the Roman Empire per- push back against the Christians, but we also see uh, cultural forces and traditional forces, and we see the the um, powerful religious structures uh, strike back at these Christians as they uh, engage the world and, and seek to be the church that God is calling them to be. And so we're calling it, as you saw on your bulletin cover, the Empire Strikes Back, which I think is really fun. Uh, so, but anyway, um, so we're starting that today. We're going to start with uh, Acts chapter 15. Now, you might remember that Throughout the book of Acts, at least in the the last few weeks of our previous series, we noticed there was a conflict growing in the early church. And that conflict specifically has to do with Gentile Christians. You know, of course, that the the faith that Jesus brought developed in a Jewish context. Uh, But as the mission of God spread into the world, Gentile Christians started being included in the new church. And this question develops, should the Gentile Christians have to follow the Jewish law? Uh, We saw this in many ways. You might remember uh, Pastor Betsy introduced this concept to us of this conflict that's growing. She preached on uh, the passage where Peter has this dream and and then he goes and baptizes Cornelius and his family who are, are Gentiles and God opens the floodgates of the good news of the gospel to the Gentile community. So that has started to happen. We also saw the, the, the end of the first missionary journey that Paul and Barnabas went on. And as they did that, they also included Gentiles in their mission. So there's this movement now to include these Gentile Christians. And it's amazing what is happening. But those individuals in the church who are Jewish, and some of them anyway, who remember how important these Jewish traditions are to them, and remember how important it is for them to follow the Jewish law, they want to include the Gentiles even in the Jewish law. So the conflict that brews is this question, is the gospel of Jesus Christ enough? Is that what we need to be saved, just the gospel of Jesus Christ? Or do we have to put on all of these rules and regulations too? Dietary laws, Sabbath laws, things like that. Do Christians need to follow those things as well? And there are Christians on both sides of this debate, and they have to figure out what is truth, what is the way to go forward, how can we do this together as a church? And that conflict has been growing and growing, and today as we begin the second half of the book of Acts, it comes to a head because they decide that once and for all they have to have this out They have to decide how to move forward, and they have a giant church conference. They all call together, uh, the the Christians together in Jerusalem to decide this once and for all. And that's where we pick up our opening scripture reading today from Acts chapter 15, beginning in the first 11 verses. And so hear the word of God. Then certain individuals came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers. Unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to discuss this question with the apostles and the elders. 
So they were sent on their way by the church, and as they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, they reported the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the believers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees stood up and said, it is necessary for them to be circumcised and ordered to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders met together to consider this matter. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, My brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that I should be the one through whom the Gentiles would hear the message of the good news and become believers. And God, who knows the human heart, testified to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And in cleansing their hearts by faith, he has made no distinction between them and us. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing on the neck of the disciples a yoke that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear? On the contrary, we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I, uh, I doubt I have to convince you in any way that we live in a very divided culture. It seems uh, more so lately than at least in recent times. Our culture is polarized. We disagree certainly about politics, but also many social issues and uh, uh, all sorts of things that we disagree about. Now, we might have different theories about why our culture is so divided right now. We might think that Uh, The internet has something to do with it. It gives this forum for people to disagree with other people that we've never had before. We might think that globalization has something to do with it. We might give any other number of reasons for the, the polarization that we experience in our culture. But whatever the reason, I think we all pretty much know it's there, right? My uh, grandmother uh, turned a hundred a few months ago. And uh, it was really great. We all got together as a family and, and had a big party for her, invited everyone together. Now, it might not surprise you to know that my family uh, never holds back. They uh, speak their mind, and we have all kinds of conversations about all sorts of things. We've never been afraid to talk about politics or religion or one another's careers or anything, you know, that you might not want to talk about. Uh, but this time, it was so different. We all got together and no one brought up politics, not one person. There actually was uh, one comment that, was, that sort of leaned in that direction and instantly I remember everyone just kind of dispersed. We all walked to different places in the party, looked away and changed the subject and just started talking to other people. I think it is a new day, at least in terms of recent times where we're dealing with this kind of, of, of polarization. And you know it happens in the church too, right? I mean, American Christianity certainly uh, is not completely unified when it comes to every single topic. We disagree about certain aspects of abortion. Uh, We might disagree about gun control. Uh, We might disagree about certain aspects of, of human sexuality. And then, of course, in the last thousand years at least, churches have had schisms separations. Our own denomination just went through a little one just a couple years ago. So we see these divisions and uh, we, we might think that they're new, that these divisions are, are bigger divisions than we're used to, to dealing with. And we might, at least if we don't think that, we might idealize the New Testament church. Right? We might think, oh, you know, yeah, sure, we have divisions today, but the New Testament church, they were in one accord. They were unified always. Certainly, if there was ever a church that was, was, had, had peace all the time, it would be the New Testament church. It's easy to think that they were perfect until we read the New Testament, right? Because throughout the New Testament, we see that even these early Christians had disagreements. 
Uh, you can't read the New Testament and come away with any other conclusion. Uh, we have a, a thread of, of uh, theological teaching throughout the New Testament that gets confronted. We call it Gnosticism. These were uh, people who were teaching something that was absolutely not Christian theology, and they would come into the churches and teach this, and, and, other Christ, and Christians had to stand up against that and have this conflict to make sure that the truth was always shared in churches. So it was common in New Testament times as well. But in our text today, in Acts 15, they are having a different kind of conflict. They are having a conflict about how to include Gentile Christians in the faith. It's a faith that's developed in the context of Judaism, as I said. They have uh, dietary laws and Sabbath laws. It's all symbolized by circumcision as entrance into the Jewish community. And people who've been Jewish and are now Christian, they either want to protect their tradition, and so they want all Christians to have to be Jewish too, or they want to make sure that everyone who is now included in the church can be fully included, and so they want them to embrace the Jewish faith too, right? It could be either thing. But regardless of their motivations, the conflict that happens is central to the gospel. Because what they are arguing about, and they are arguing, is so core to the gospel. The question they're asking is, are we saved by the grace of Christ alone? Or do we need to do things on top of that to be saved? It is a core issue. It is so central. Luke, when he writes this, he says, they had no small dissension or debate. This was huge for them. In fact, I think it's safe to say that there was more at stake in their disagreement than any of the disagreements we're having today, because it was so core to the gospel. I mean, imagine if our church had that discussion. If we, if it was an open question for us, is Jesus Christ enough, or do we have to do these other things too? That would be such a difficult conversation to have, far more difficult than any church discussions I've ever had. For us, that's settled, and this is the moment it gets settled, because the apostles, disciples, these Christians meeting in Jerusalem come away, and they affirm once and for all that it is by grace alone that we are saved. You don't need to do all of these other things in addition to that to be saved. But they have to settle this, and they have to have this conflict about it. And so what do they do? How do they decide, that, uh, how do they decide this together? Well, they have a big, giant church meeting. It's basically general assembly. If you are Presbyterian, you know what that is. If you're not, you might not know, but every couple years we all get together. We have this uh, giant church meeting that helps us decide things. Well, that is exactly what they do in Acts 15. But what is so different about this meeting, and I'm sure you noticed this as we were reading the text together, what is so different is that as they are trying to figure out this, this extremely difficult debate, this huge dissension, somehow they also have unity. Somehow they are able to do something that we don't see anywhere almost in our culture. People who disagree and yet have unity. And I think having that kind of unity in disagreement could, could help our world so much. Don't you think so? Because that is an amazing thing. And so we read Acts 15 and we want to ask, how on earth do they do this? How can they have such a big debate and yet have unity the way that Luke writes this? How can that be possible? And, and we might jump to conclusions and think, well, you know, they must have been really good at peacemaking. They must have had some really good peacemaking strategy. Or we think, well, you know, they must have been really good at, at just uh, affirming tolerance, saying, you know, everything's okay, we're just going to be tolerant. Or maybe they, um, they did other things too, just to make sure that, that, um, uh, that, 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 that everything was peaceful and quiet. Maybe they just valued others in the midst of that. But that is not what they did. They didn't do any of those things. They have a secret 
to creating unity in the midst of diversity that we miss sometimes. You know what it is? To make unity, they just listen to God. They get together, they don't necessarily agree, but in the midst of it, in the midst of everything they do, they just listen to God. That is all we have to do to have unity with people with whom we disagree, is listen to God the way these first Christians listened to God. Now, I want to point out four ways really quickly that these disciples gathered and listened to God, because these are the ways that they, um, that they uh, created this, this unity. And this is the way that I think we could show the world a unity that the world doesn't see anywhere else. Now, the first way that um, I'm going to ask David to put up, uh, we've got a list here. Um, thanks, David. There we go. Uh, um, the, uh, the first way that these disciples gathered and listened to God was that they listened to God through one another. We read that the whole assembly gathered, and this assembly even included those who disagreed, right? They didn't shut out uh, one side or another, they all got together and they listened. But as they listened, they didn't just hear the arguments and think about the merits of each person's case or anything like that. They listened for the voice of God in the other person. Luke writes, there was much debate, as you can imagine. They were not afraid to differ. And there were many voices that were included. You know who else they listened to as they listened to one another? They also listened to uh, the the leaders of their church. It says in, in, as Luke writes, that that the, the apostles and the elders met together. We hear from James, not in our text, but afterwards, James is this leader in the church and he stands up and he speaks and they all listen to him. In the text we read, we hear from Peter. Peter is certainly a leader in the church. He stands up and and expresses himself as well. And so they all gather together. They listen to to, uh, dissenting voices, but they also listen to the leadership of the church. Now, this might be an awkward thing for some pastors to talk about, But in a Presbyterian setting, right, we have shared leadership, and just like they do. This is not one person, but it's a group of leaders who come together, the elders, just like our session, and they listen to these leaders as they gather together. The other people that they listen for the voice of God in are the people on the ground. They're listening to the people who are actually doing the ministry. Luke writes that these elite Pharisees came, And as these elite Pharisees came, they listened to them too, but they also listened to Paul and Barnabas. They weren't in this elite class. Paul wasn't anymore, and Barnabas wasn't. But they were on the ground doing the the ministry and knew these Gentiles personally, and so they they listened, uh, listened to them. Another way that they listened to the voice of God was through Scripture. James, uh, we, we meet James kind of for the first time here. We, we heard James, we heard his name in, in chapter 12 for a moment, but we haven't really seen him in action yet. And James is the brother of Jesus, and he's a, a leader of the church. And, uh, and, and, and he gets up uh, just after the passage that we read, and he shares from the book of Amos. He reads scripture and they they seek God through scripture. And as he's sharing about Amos, he proves to the people that God's intent was always to include the Gentiles. From the very beginning, God had this plan to include all people and include the Gentiles. And so uh, they look to scripture and they, they discover that. They're not looking to tradition. They're not looking to the way things have always been. They are discerning truth. They are seeking, uh, seeking truth, discerning theology. And they use scripture even to narrow down the specifics. How should people live? And later on, they come up with sort of four things that, that, that are, are good reminders, things like sexual morality and not eating meat offered to idols. They use scripture to, to set parameters for them as they, as they move forward. But here's the thing is, they're not compromising. 
right? They're not gathering together. They're not just listening to different opinions and saying, okay, how can we make a decision here that makes everybody happy? How can we just come up with something that has a little bit for everybody? They're not doing that. They are listening to God and they're looking at scripture and they're actually saying what's right. What other group do you know that can do that? That can come together and say, we're going to decide what's right and not everyone's going to agree. What group can do that and still have the kind of amazing unity that they have in the book of Acts? It's incredible. And it's because they're listening for God in one another. They're listening for God in scripture. Another way they listen for God, this is so cool, is they are especially attentive to how God is at work among them. What are the things that God is already doing? And they want to listen to that. They have this disagreement, but they ask, what is God up to? What is his mission? How is he at work? Paul and Barnabas have returned from this amazing first missionary journey. They've engaged with these uh, uh, Gentiles and seen these amazing things. And they come back and they share. And what does Luke say? There is joy about this. They're hearing these amazing experiences and Paul and Barnabas didn't do it. God did it. And they're excited about that. We hear about that. And then just after our text, Paul and Barnabas, they start doing it again. And the whole assembly is so riveted by these stories that Paul and Barnabas bring back that Luke writes that they kept silent and they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they told of all the signs and wonders that God had done through them among the Gentiles. And then as we read, Peter stands up and Peter recounts this, uh, this call that he's experienced, that God gave him this call to, to be in ministry with the Gentiles. He, he says that and he even reminds them, that, you know what? God has sent the Holy Spirit to these Gentiles. And for Peter, that's proof because God's at work. God is doing things among the people. This is very different than experience, right? If we want to have unity, we might get together to talk about a disagreement and say, well, what's your experience? And what's my experience? And well, I remember this person did this and this person said this, and we come to some kind of, of agreement together. That's not what they're doing. They're listening for God in their experiences. Very different thing. And then the last way that I want to point out anyway that they're, that they're listening to God is, and this is by far the most important way. In fact, we could maybe forget the other three and just go with this one, is that they listen to the grace of Christ for all people. They, they see that what connects them is the fact that they are forgiven in Jesus Christ and that all people are forgiven in Jesus Christ. And isn't it ironic that this is the very thing they're debating? They're actually having this disagreement about the very thing that connects them like nothing else could possibly connect them. I mean, if you're saved by works, right? If you have to follow these Jewish laws to be saved, then some people are better than others, right? Because some people are doing it maybe a little better than other people are doing it. But they say, no, that is not what saves us. What saves us is the grace of Christ. And that is for all people. And if that's for all people, then we are all the same. I am saved by Jesus Christ just as much as you are. And vice versa, people who we disagree with are saved by Jesus Christ just as much as we are. And so not only are the Gentiles themselves, just like the Jewish people, saved by grace like everyone else. But grace in the text in Acts 15 is what makes no distinction, Luke writes, between us and them. And so Peter stands up and he says, why would we put a yoke upon people that we can't even bear? Why would we expect people to follow a law that is so hard for us to follow and even our ancestors couldn't follow it? And then Peter says this amazing line. He says, we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. This is not mushy community, right? This is not just, oh, let's all get along. Jesus Christ died for them. 
and not just for them, for everyone. And so this is a community grounded in the grace of Christ. That brings us together. I think all of this is surprisingly relevant as we think about building community that is unified, even in disagreement. As we look at our world, I think it's surprising how those four attitudes of listening to God in the midst of disagreement can change our lives and can bring us together with people. I mean, what are the things in your life that, that draws, pulls you apart from people? Maybe you have divisions in your life, in your family or your neighbors or your friendships, your workplace. Maybe those divisions come from politics. Maybe those divisions come from social issues like immigration or gun control or something like that. Maybe you're having an argument, a real argument in your family about the past or with your neighbor. What is something in your life that is pulling you apart from somebody else? Think about that and then imagine what would it be like to, to re-engage in that situation with, with the desire of listening to God to listen to God through that other person you're having that disagreement with, to listen to God through scripture, to observe how is God at work in this situation and, and, and discover that and listen to that. And most of all, to know that the grace of Jesus covers that person that you're having that disagreement with just like it covers you. And there couldn't be anything more unifying than the grace of Christ in both of your lives. You might remember the, the passage Judith read to us uh, a moment ago. The first passage was Psalm 133. How very good and pleasant it is when kindred live together in unity. We get that unity by the grace of Christ, and we understand that more by listening to God. I think that we could actually help our world in this very divided time by listening to God in these ways. Let's pray together.